on Zoom as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Zachariah Watson. I'm the Executive Director for Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. And uh, we are today uh, giving our final public hearing presentation um, about the, what, we, what the um, application for the grant was called the Carbon Negative Affordable Housing Development. And it's located at 102 to 110 Northfield Street here in Montpelier. Uh, we have a pretty comprehensive agenda today. We had a lot of uh, deliverables, um, work products that came as a result of this project. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we're going to start by reviewing the agenda, what we're doing right now, talk a little bit about meeting format outcomes, um, the goals of the planning grant, as well as our goals, ha Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and then review the different deliverables. Um, archaeological resource assessment, the architectural and engineering feasibility study, uh, market study, phase one environmental site assessment, and talk about uh, our determination of feasibility based on the results that came uh, uh, from the planning grant. Um, so the city of Montpelier, it's just some background, the city of Montpelier received $60,000 uh, from a community development block planning grant from the state of Vermont uh, under the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, by the Community Development Program. Uh, and we, C Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, were the subrecipient of that grant. Uh, this meeting is actually a requirement uh, of, that, uh, of that planning grant to close it out. So this is our final public hearing and is being hosted by the City of Montpelier. Got Josh Jerome in the back. Thanks, Josh. Um, and uh, basically, this is an opportunity for residents to provide, uh, have the opportunity to learn about the proposal and uh, to provide comment. Um, so uh, for folks on Zoom, um, uh, I do see you there. And basically, if you have questions, uh, raise your, uh, use the raise hand function or turn on your screen and wave at me. Um, hopefully, we can get through the presentation and we have some time for question and answer at the end. Uh, meeting minutes are being recorded by Josh in the back there and will be submitted along with our final report. Uh, they will include a list of attendees. So if you actually haven't signed in yet, there's a sign-up sheet over there. We'd love for you to just put your name down so we know you are here. Um, and we will also include a brief description of what was presented, any discussion that takes place. Uh, and if folks have written comments, they can also submit them to Josh to include with the media, uh, meeting minutes. Um, so smaller crowd than um, we've had in the past, so probably don't need many uh, get ground rules. But the rule of, th uh, rule of thumb here is, you know, to treat everyone with uh, kindness and respect. Um, uh, you know, we've all been out of the public eye for for a little while because of COVID. So getting back into it, uh, just remembering that this is a discussion; it's not a debate. Um, you know, we're not trying to win anything here. Uh, we'd love for everybody to participate. Uh, we might, I might even call on you, probably not, but I might call on you, and if I do, you're welcome to say, you know, pass. Uh, but I uh, really want everybody to uh, participate and not feel that they shouldn't participate. Uh, really would prefer that everybody get a chance to speak, although with the number of people here, I think we will um, have, everybody will have an opportunity to share, but uh, try not to dominate the conversation. Um, and uh, when you speak, we'd love to hear who you are and where you live, um, and just to personalize you. And uh, just make sure that w you're not speaking when somebody else is speaking. And part of that is also just being respectful, um, no disrespectful or discriminatory behavior while somebody else is speaking. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, before you speak, uh, try to understand the pros and cons of every option and knowing that there are diverse opinions that come through these, uh, to these public hearings. Uh, so seek first to understand, not to be understood. Um, so seek questions that ask clarification um, to someone's comments. And, and also don't talk to uh, the speaker and not to each other as best as possible. Um, so a little background about the project. Um, uh, Habitat for Humanity has been seeking a long-term construction strategy uh, to build more houses more, more efficiently here in Vermont. So we typically have built one house every other year. That's uh, a lot of time and energy that goes into one house. Uh, so we were thinking about how do we actually build more houses more quickly. And uh, about three years ago, we talked about identifying a parcel of land where we could build uh, houses on for the next 10 years. And it takes a lot of the work out of, of that. And so we, uh, coincidentally, um, we were approached by a landowner here in Montpelier, Massa North LLC, uh, who, um, who owns 50, it's basically two acres that equate to 56.8 acres at 102 to 110 Northfield Street. 
um, and um, and he wanted to talk about us using the land for something good. Uh, he was a bit of altruism in his efforts, um, and so we. Uh, we ourselves obviously didn't want to take on the size project. Uh, it was right at the, right at before COVID. It was right at the beginning of COVID, really. Uh, so we talked to a lot of developers, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, the Vermont State Housing Authority, talked to Downstreet. Uh, basically, nobody had the capacity or the ability to take on this size project. Uh, and we felt that it was too much of an opportunity to, to let go. And so we stepped outside of our traditional role of building a house every two years to get into this position of um, determining the feasibility of a very large housing development. Um, and so <laughs> that's how we ended up with this. I like to tell people if we knew what we know now, we probably wouldn't have taken it on. But here we are, and we've gotten about to the end. So the parcel um, is it's actually two parcels, total of 56.8 acres. Um, the, there's a three acre parcel of land in the bottom here, which actually includes 11 rental units. That's, one, oh, that's 110 Northfield Street. The rest of this is 102, and this is 50.8 acres, something like that, 53.8 acres. Um, so in 2021, Habitat for Humanity Board of Directors approved our uh, signing the purchase option agreement. We then were approved for a $10,000 VHCB feasibility grant. Uh, and then a $50,000 grant through the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, it's a playing grant, that's why we're here today. Um, in 2021, in December, we completed an environmental res uh, resource assessment in 2022. Uh, we created our uh, Development Evaluation Committee, who are all here today, so thank you guys for being here. Um, and, uh, and then April, uh, we pursued a zoning change for the parcel. We, we converted it from rural to residential 9,000, which increased the allowable density on the parcel. In May of 2022, we selected Engineering Ventures, Gossen Bachman Architecture, Park Architecture, and VIS Consulting to be our, to conduct our architectural and engineering feasibility study. Um, and uh, we completed that in August of 2022. We then completed in December our phase one environmental site assessment January 2023, we completed a market analysis and an appraisal. And June of 2023, uh, our last deliverable, we completed a traffic study. Um, so while we at Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity oversaw the completion of the planning grant, we had a lot of support from consultants who are all listed up here. Engineering Ventures, Doug Kennedy Advisors, VIS Construction Consultants, Gossen Bachman Architecture and Planning, Park Architecture, KAS, Hartchin, Archaeological uh, uh, Associates, and Martin Appraisal Services. And obviously, we also had a lot of support from uh, the city of uh, Montpelier. Um, our development team, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Our development team uh, is, our, it's our, really we call ourselves the, uh, m one, uh, the Northfield Street Development Task Force, uh, is is made up of James Brady, he's, a, um, he's our secretary, he's a former consultant with ACCTD and now works at Forest Parks, uh, the Forest Service, uh, and also an abutter. Uh, Neil Husher is, our, is an architect. Allison Donovan works for VEIC, she's a manager and consultant. Uh, Soren Pfeffer is a real estate agent. Uh, Peter Howerhan, a retired planner and Boston-based developer. And Jim Hutton, a web, uh, web consultant and longtime building committee member and uh, a member of Montpelier. So uh, this is a group effort. Uh, so as I said, we received a total of $60,000 from the Community Development Block Pro Program grant, um, another $14,000 from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and $1,500 from the City of Montpelier to complete the planning grant to determine the architectural, engineering, and financial feasibility of building a housing development on 53.8 acres uh, at 102 to 110 Northfield Street. Um, Basically, the project uh, proposes to explore building a mixed income housing development on the project site um, through this planning grant. Uh, and we had a number of goals as part of the grant. Uh, determine the maximum number of units that could be built on the house, determine uh, on the parcel, determine the financial feasibility and the overall cost of actual implementation, De determine the feasibility and cost of connecting the potential housing to the city's water and wastewater systems uh, to determine the best options for building a road and connecting to electric utilities. 
uh, investigating ge geographic zoning and environmental restrictions that would limit housing on the parcel, uh, work with the planning and zoning department of the city of Montpelier um, to determine which is the best type of planned unit development for the site, and then f uh, figure out best options for providing electric utilities to development uh, to the proposed development. Uh, this uh, basically community development block grants are HUD funded, um, and so there is also a national objective, and that national objective is um, low to moderate income housing. So as the uh, the result of the planning grant shall have the potential to provide benefit of at least 51% of those served would be persons of low to moderate income. Uh, and low to moderate income is 80% of the area median income. Uh, so basically, uh, the number of houses, at least 51, should be designed to serve a low to moderate income households. Um, so we've got our lovely uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, City of Montpelier, and HCCD up there. So the first thing that we did, um, well, we also, uh, sorry, Habitat for Humanity had its own objectives as well, in addition to the objectives we set out in the grant. Uh, the first was we wanted to com com uh, uh, complete a conservation housing development with publicly accessible and maintained trail network. You notice that our title of the project was called Carbon Negative Affordable Housing Development. Uh, carbon negative, we had a goal of uh, developing this in a way that the materials and resources that we were using uh, would be low carbon, th this would be a net zero um, community, and that the uh, conserved land put into a, a conservation easement, uh, per perpetually uh, wild, uh, or uh, forever wild, uh, would potentially offset any carbon that was uh, generated through the project. I've since learned that that's pretty, pretty near impossible uh, with the size of lots, so, but it was, uh, that's where we started off, and that's what we still strive towards, um, because it's, um, you know, it's our responsibility. Uh, we also wanted to use a planned unit development, because uh, we knew there were some restrictions with the site uh, to concentrate the developable area on, a, on the, um, the, the allowable density on the developable area. We also wanted to create a community, uh, create a sense of place with this community. Uh, it's not just houses on a map, we're creating a real community. Uh, how do these places interact with each other? How do we draw them into the community that we're developing? Uh, we want to connect to municipal water and sewer. Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a financial issue reason for that. Um, ultimately, this, if this is going to be designed for affordable housing, low-income Vermonters, uh, the additional costs associated with maintaining private uh, water or wastewater system um, is, is be, it becomes too expensive. Uh, you have homeowner association fees, and so the idea is that we are building a, uh, a community that also is a municipally runs utilities and road. Um, we want to be a part of this, so we've, uh, we would like there to be income sensitive home ownership. So uh, for Habitat for Humanity Homes, so there, there, there's a homeowners earning less than 80% of the area median income. We also wanted to include uh, rentals, uh, income-sensitive rentals. Uh, we also want to include fair market workforce housing in partnership with developers and, um, and industries. Uh, so that's all a part of we want to create a mixed income community. We don't want to be this all low income. We don't want it to be all market. We believe strongly that if we have a good mix of economics uh, in an area that that leads to the success of the homeowners there, especially for our, the low income families. So that, those were our goals as we approached this. So as I said, the, um, so during the initial application period, the Section 106 preliminary review by the Vermont Department of Historic F Preservation, they found that there was potential for archaeological and historic properties uh, that would be affected by the proposed project. Uh, so we were required to complete an archaeological resource assessment uh, with a qualified um, archaeological consultant. So the, the reason that they uh, asked us to do this was because you have the Winooski River going here, and you have an elevated parcel of land, and uh, there is some historical evidence that elevated land overlooking a river traditionally served as a sort of um, uh, a, 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 an important area for indigenous people. And so they wanted to make sure that that was not the case on this parcel, so they asked us to do that. So we completed an RFP and ultimately contracted with HeartGen Archaeological Associates to complete an archaeological resource assessment. Um, and the project objectives were to identify areas of archaeological sensitivity based on environmental factors, known site information, and historic information for the project area of potential effects. Um, 
basically, uh, the background research was conducted at the VDHP, Vermont Department of Historic Preservation Online Research Center, where archaeological sites are filed, the National Register, State Register, and town information was reviewed. Uh, the, uh, the contractor, Elise Manning, also did a site visit on November 17, 2021, uh, to observe and photograph existing conditions. Basically, um, you know, the, the, she, she filled out something called the, uh, the Environmental Predictive Model, uh, which came out with an overall rating of 12. Um, and so she did look at uh, this, you know, initially she gave a lot of points, 32 points, uh, to the pre-contact sensitivity um, based on its location, as I talked about before. Um, but then, it re then those 32 points were reduced uh, primarily because uh, it's a, it, there's no actual water on the site and because the site is very steep. So um, there's really no easily accessible way to access water from this site. So there's no real connection between the water and the high ground. And so based on the low pre-contact and historical archaeological sensitivity of the parcel, no further archaeological investigation was recommended for this parcel. And the Vermont Department of Historic Preservation uh, concurred with those conclusions. Uh, they agreed with them on uh, February 23, 2023, 2022, excuse me. Um, so I'm going to go through all these deliverables. I was hoping folks would hold their questions till the end, but I realize I'm going to be talking a lot. So if folks do have, and since we have a relatively small crowd, if folks do have questions while I'm speaking, feel free to raise your hand, or you know, just let me know. I think that we can handle it that way. Um, so I do want to, you know, the parcel itself, uh, talking, give you a little perspective about how we approach this, um, looking at a topographical map uh, of the parcel. Uh, it's all the area that's in green and red there. Um, you can see what our obvious uh, constraints were and opportunities. So you can see that basically all around the exterior, this red area, so red is very steep, green is not so steep, steep gray is flat, and yellow is pretty steep, but not terribly steep. So, but as you can see, the whole parcel is surrounded by a giant red uh, area. Um, and and uh, so we basically cannot build there. Or we, we, you could build there, it would cost a lot of money, and it didn't make any sense. So um, I call this area the Acropolis because it's flat at the top and you've got steep walls on all sides. So we knew we were dealing with that right away. The other piece was, is if you look, uh, is, you know, when it's steep on all sides, where are you going to get up there? Where are you going to get up to this flat area? And it really, uh, I mean, you can see it right there in the bottom left-hand corner. There's one flattish kind of road that goes and connects down to this private drive um, that then connects to Northfield Street. So we, um, you know, we looked at all access routes uh, ultimately to see if there was any real potential um, for uh, alternative access routes. And really, this is the only access route to the property. Um, and as you can see, there are still red places there. So it's, uh, it is still steep in some sections. The other thing I just want to point out is there is a unique um, hollow right in the middle. Uh, there's no indications that it actually serves any purpose for drainage, um, but it, uh, it basically separates the two uh, flat areas uh, that we could build on. So we, we, started, we actually identified that these are two separate um, buildable areas on the parcel. Um, so with those constraints in mind, we started to look at uh, what we, where we could build, where we couldn't build, and that started to shape um, you know, this picture that you're looking at here. So we know that, uh, the, again, all along the exterior is too steep, and we had already put the goal of creating a conservation housing development. So we thought, OK, if we can't build here, why don't we just put it into a conservation easement? So that was the idea, and we've talked to, we talked to a number of people about this, but ultimately our goal was and, and uh, is to work with the city to, uh, for them to eventually take this over and turn it into a publicly accessible trail network, which leaves this yellow and green area, which are um, technically flat enough to develop on. Uh, we did only focus on this yellow area because of this uh, hollow separating it, um, but also because this is uh, still higher and it requires uh, additional infrastructure, uh, which doesn't make it impossible to build up here, but it definitely makes it pr a lot more complicated and more expensive. So we focused on this yellow area right here. 
Um, so the current, um, so based on this, basically 25.9 acres would be available for development. 3.2 acres would be retained by Mass and North LLC, and 24.6 acres, so half of the parcel would be set aside for conservation. Uh, the current zoning is residential 9,000. As I said, we converted it. Uh, this has an allowable density of up to one dwelling unit per 9,000 square feet. Uh, so if uh, the parcel were subdividing, subdivided, it leaves 50 acres for the development total. Even though this is in conservation, it is still considered part of the whole development. Um, so with that in mind, 50 acres uh, divided by 9,000 square feet uh, would support a maximum of 242 units, uh, housing units. Uh, and basically in order to create a dense development to, and conserve as much land as possible, uh, we would need a planned unit development, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, and so we, and, and ultimately when we worked with uh, the architectural and engineering feasibility study, it was determined that the best planned unit development for this project uh, was a general planned unit development. Um, planned unit development is basically, it's a zoning term um, that, uh, that it, it allows for you to concentrate the total allowable density. So if you can build 242 units, normally you have setback requirements, you have um, parcel sizes and things like that. And it would have forced us, if we had to just follow residential 9,000, the only way we'd be able to build 150 units is to develop this whole thing, uh, to, to parcelize and clear cut. Uh, and so a planning development allows you to take all of the allowable development density, housing density, and focus it in on a single area. Uh, the D PUD, planning development, has to be approved by the uh, Development Review Board uh, as well as the City Council. Um, so basically, oh, there we go. Um, just want to, you know, the, with the general with the general plan unit development, uh, there are some um, recommendations that it, do, it doesn't fit precisely into the PU, uh, the uh, the general planned unit development. Uh, like I said, the um, they would have to, the board as well as the uh, city council would have to approve dimensional standards for the building, height requirements, individual parcel setbacks, and individual parcel coverage as allowed by the regulation. Uh, and there might be some waivers and uh, conditional uses that would be required depending on the final design uh, that is selected. Um, <clears throat> so, this is ultimately after much uh, back and forth and a couple public hearings, uh, we landed on a concept design. This was our final concept design uh, that we came up with. We had about nine total. Um, and, um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what this is. It's, a, it's, a, it's total, it's, a, it's 115 units um, uh, on the entire parcel. There's uh, two 60 unit uh, multi-family buildings um, and these are the big there's a big one right here at the entrance and there's another there uh, so these we were uh, in our initial research learned that 30 units was kind of the sweet spot for low-income um, rental units that are supported by a funding source called the low-income housing tax credit it's the largest funding source for affordable rentals in the state and so uh, we thought, we, when we learned that 30 units was the sweet spot, we decided to make sure that we included a couple 30 units there. So basically, this large unit here uh, could be a low-income uh, rental. Um, then the second one back here could also be low-income rentals, although uh, after uh, hearing, you know, there's, there's different potential as well. There is a huge need for senior housing in Washington County. Uh, this could also be uh, subsidized senior housing. Um, and uh, so the other thing is we have 18 townhouses. So these are these three blocks, uh, one there, one there, and one there. So the townhouses are ta side by side. There's six per, per block there. Uh, those could be, those would essentially be fair market housing. Uh, we had 22 duplexes, so 11 buildings total, uh, 22 to uh, units total. These would ideally be habitat for humanity units, 80% area median income uh, for home ownership. Um, there are 15 uh, fair market uh, single family houses, which could be fair market um, or subsidized missing middle income housing for workforce housing. 
um, and those are kind of in, dispersed throughout the development. Uh, back here, we almost have what we call the phase three. Uh, it's a cottage cluster. These are 900 square foot cottages. And uh, we thought of this as ideal for um, subsidized uh, transitional housing for seniors. Um, so they can move out of the big houses in downtown Montpelier and move up to some of these smaller units uh, that are easier to maintain, but also staying being connected to a community, a thriving community, hopefully. Um, so as I said, of, uh, we have this requirement for 51% of the housing units to serve folks that are below 80%. Um, of the 115 units, 60 units are designed for people earning less than 80% of the area median income. Uh, in addition to housing, there's also uh, an interconnected trail network. We were very thoughtful about this, and we got a lot of feedback from um, our neighbors. But there was already some existing trail networks over in the area that were considered to be conserved. And we actually connected those and expanded them uh, to connect and go right into the development, also go around the development. Uh, you know, creating a direct connection uh, to, from this, from this uh, housing development to the conserved land around it. There's also three community gardens, one, two, and three. Uh, there are two plazas. Um, plazas are part of our sense of place, uh, which bring uh, the community together. This also slows down traffic a little bit uh, so that, uh, you know, you don't have people blowing through. Uh, there's also a playground in the bottom here and a total of 179 parking spaces. Um, just to, you know, we have some visualization of what a uh, cottage cluster would look like, what the streets might look like, your traditional sort of neighborhood. Um, and uh, so just to give you a sense of what it might look like. Uh, so we did look a lot at stormwater. Obviously, this is really important for the folks that live around it. Um, so. Right now, the runoff from the site currently drains into one of three catchment areas. Uh, the western sub-watershed drains to Northfield Street, uh, so this direction over here. Um, and that's where it's captured by the municipal uh, wastewater system and then discharged into the Winooski. Uh, there's a north central sub-watershed which uh, drains to an existing ravine, which enters into a culvert. Uh, you can see this line here uh, that is connected to a combined uh, water system on Pleasant Street. Um, and then the eastern watershed drains across both Hill Street and Prospect Street, where it enters into a municipal closed drainage system. So three watershed drainage uh, areas. So the stormwater for our proposed project would be connected to municipal stormwater, as we discussed earlier. Um, and there would also be three to four treatment areas or other forms of green infrastructure. Treatment area is typically something like a rain garden. Um, but other forms of green infrastructure which were included in this to reduce the amount of runoff included uh, no curb sidewalks uh, and lots of green area, but also we have a tremendous amount of green area surrounding it. Um, basically, Engineering Ventures, our consultant on this, uh, performed a conceptual stormwater design for the feasibility study. Um, to incorporate stormwater conveyance treatment and uh, and um, that would be uh, that would fall into the, uh, Vermont's uh, stormwater management uh, systems and the conceptual design what that was created uh, is determined to be adequate uh, for the budget costs and will also work um, to fulfill the uh, the state stormwater operational permit requirements. Um, we won't have this is our. Uh, we won't f create a final wastewater design until um, the implementation phase. Um, but this is a rough design, and that's not typically something we would do until we knew more about the concept design. Uh, so utilities, um, you know, the best projected route for electrical, water, wastewater, and internet and sewer lines is along the new access route connected to uh, Northfield Street, uh, and. Uh, we did confirm with Montpelier DPW that there is capacity at the water resource recovery facility, our wastewater facility, as well as the water lines along Northfield Street to support the proposed development. Uh, the parcel would actually connect to a new 16-inch ductile iron pipe uh, to provide um, residential fire and, protect and protection services. There was also a new pump installed on Northfield Street for water. We also completed a water flow test, which was comp uh, done by uh, the Dufresne Group. Um, basically, the location within the development, which was selected for the simulation 
this flow test simulation was at 795 feet in elevation. Um, and based on the static pressure uh, of the simulation, uh, it, was a, it had approximately 73 uh, pounds per square inch, which is considered adequate uh, pressure for this size development. So shown that there is water, uh, water can get up there, and there's adequate uh, utilities within the municipality um, for this particular project, which was an important part of the deliverable. Uh, so as I said, uh, as you saw in the beginning, that opportunities and constraints map, we always knew that street access was going to be a challenge uh, for developing this site. And as I mentioned, there's really only one viable access route to the parcel, uh, and it is actually steep and it's long. Uh, so it takes a while, it takes a, there's quite a distance before it actually gets uh, to an area that a building can be developed. And ultimately that was, uh, we believe, the biggest impediment for uh, developing this parcel in the past. You have about a thousand foot long road before you can build a house. That's a very expensive cost uh, before you can actually build something you can sell. Um, so there's uh, the proposed access, including the sidewalk. Uh, would be would start on an existing right of way. So we would um, the landowner Massa North LSC has right of way along uh, the private drive that serves 116 Northfield and 120 Northfield, which is the Montpelier Housing Authority. Uh, so it would go up there. It would um, then turn up into what is the uh, old logging road. Um, and in order to build. Uh, a road which conforms with municipal city ordinances. Um, the 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 new the proposed access route actually needs to intersect um, with Northfield Street, 150 feet away from Derby Drive. So we couldn't use the existing private drive. This is okay as a private drive for this uh, intersection, but um, when it becomes a public street, which is our goal, uh, that's the only way we can make utilities um, be covered by the city. Uh, it does need to become a conforming intersection, which requires that it is at least 150 feet away from the nearest intersection, which is Derby Drive. So that's why we have to do this funny uh, loop up into uh, 110 uh, Northfield Street there. And um, so that, uh, that, that was a big change. Um, you know, the, we, this is a concept design, so the current design actually does not show a conforming road or intersection. We would still, there are sections of it that are um, above 10% grade, uh, which is the city doesn't allow, uh, does not like roads that are above 10% grade. And so we would need to not only do this intersection, but also to design the road uh, that is below 10%. And we believe there's, this is, we absolutely believe this is possible. Uh, according to Engineering Ventures, there's two ways that we could do this. Uh, we can extend the whole road, so you have more road, it means you can go a longer distance. Um, uh, one, by extending this access point further up that way. So now we've got more road there. It, we also like that it cut it also might create some additional uh, treatment, stormwater treatment areas, or like I said, um, rain gardens. Um, we could also extend, uh, basically make this a larger loop here. This is the Montpelier Housing Authority again, so this would be a larger kind of turn that would extend the road a little bit. Um, and then the other part is that we're just doing more cutting uh, into the ledge at the beginning, um, uh, where that 30 unit apartment building was at the beginning. Um, and so that the grade stays at 10% and the length of the most western road. Um, basically, we would have to do the whole, redo the whole lower loop, but um, it is absolutely possible, and we are committed to designing an access route which, um, which would serve the proposed housing development um, and would also conform to the city of Montpelier zoning regulations prior to starting the development on this. Uh, we also did conduct a traffic study. Question. Yeah, go ahead. You have to have two access roads. In other discussions about other parcels, there's been sort of uh, conflicting information from whether you need two access roads or not. Uh, yeah, good question. So this uh, there is, um, you don't need it. There is a waiver. Um, the, the city could provide a waiver on those things. And I believe there was a recent development where a waiver was provided. Um, and I think that it, uh, basically you have um, you have the city ordinances, uh, and then there's sort of best practices. And um, so there's, my understanding is that the discussion around those things is, is finding the best 
a compromise between those pieces. But uh, in conversations with the city, uh, they feel, you know, ultimately it comes down to fire and safety. Uh, we want to make sure that they can get out. Um, and so you, oftentimes you don't see streets connecting to other streets in Montpelier. And what you see instead is round uh, cul-de-sacs or hammerheads. So as long as um, there is an a, a way for the development, um, for fire trucks to turn around, you can usually uh, fulfill that need. Um, and I'll just sh get, uh, go back a little bit. Um, so we actually, uh, if you look back at this design here, I feel like I should just have this permanently here. Uh, there's two loops. There's one loop here, and there's one loop here. Um, we designed this to actually be two phases um, of construction. And so in order to create that roundabout option for fire uh, access, we, uh, the first phase would be this loop, and the second phase would be this loop, um, so that we're, we're meeting the, those, those, we're providing a sa safe conditions for fire. But it, it would require um, the mm. development review board and the city council to approve any waivers of that. Good question, Paul. Um, now back to our exciting access discussion. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, so we did a traffic study. I do want to just say that uh, you know the, I, I've got some points here. And I, I know some of this is terribly boring. A lot of work went into it, um, and, it and it is, you know, at, at the t every time we look at it, this is very exciting. But then all together, it's, all, it's a lot of talking. Um, but basically, a traffic study um, or transportation impact study was completed for the new proposed intersection by Wall Consultant Group. Um, basically, the full build uh, project, both phase one and phase two, is estimated to generate 50 new trip ends on average during the weekend, a weekday AM peak hours, and 67 new trip ends at the average weekday in the afternoon uh, uh, peak, peak hour, excuse me. Uh, and 838 trips ends over the course of an average weekday. Um, at 67 afternoon peak hour trips, um, the new vehicle trip generation associated with the project is less than 75. Why that's significant is typically these traffic studies are not required until the average trip, a uh, new trip generated, is over 75. Um, so basically, for every household, you, you expect 0.5 trips. I think that's how it's calculated. 115 divided by 2 is 60 something. Um, and so that's 67. So that's why um, we don't expect this to generate a lot of additional trips. And Vermont uh, VTrans um, has set 75 as a, as a threshold um, to require a traffic study. We are below that. But we did it anyways because we care, and it's good research to have. It's good information to have. Um, so based on the, the, uh, the analysis conducted, um, the, uh, this project is not expected to impact the condition, the capacity of the affected roads. The proposed project won't create any new safety or congestion issues or make any existing issues worse. Um, we're expect, this line of sight is expected to meet the Vermont Transportation's line of sight standards. Uh, we're not expecting there to be a bunch of lines, uh, traffic uh, generated from this. Uh, the topography at this spot, this intersection, is relatively straight, line, uh, level line of clear of sight. Um, so the stopping and intersection site distances meet uh, required minimum design target site distances. Um, and we also, the consultant also looked at uh, high crash locations and determined that there's no notable pattern of crashes near the site. Uh, so those are all good things uh, for us anyways. So, uh, and also the number, um, uh, it does, it, it, there's no need, uh, they also didn't find that there's a need to install a, um, a light or turn lanes uh, for this project. We'll note that at the time of the traffic study, there was no information on the proposed Boves project across the street. Which, uh, and I still don't know what it is. I think there was an article recently about it. But thus, I, and I don't know if they have submitted any information to the town. So we know there is a proposed development. And that will probably impact traffic. We don't know by how, by how much. And uh, so we couldn't incorporate it into the traffic study because it would have been entirely guesswork. 
at that point. Um, but we do know that that is coming in and it is a consideration. Um, and, it, and it was recommended that once we, there is more uh, information about the both project, then another traffic study be done. Um, so full disclosure on that one. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just dip apologies if you've already answered this. In that last slide, there is a crosswalk with a yellow flashing light right where Northfield Street and Derby Drive come together. How will that happen? Will it be, will it remain where it is or? Um, so th we're not planning to use this area anymore. It might stay there. We might pave it up and close it. I don't really know. But I mean, it, uh, it would be another part of the road that we would have to maintain and wouldn't be used. So more than likely, we just wouldn't, the, whoever develops it would not use that. Um, so I don't, I don't anticipate that. I mean, we didn't talk about that at all, but I, I don't anticipate it would impact. So there's a crosswalk right there, you said? OK. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, that seems like a safety thing. I don't know why they would take that out. It's a good. It's a good question. Um, all right. It's pre-development and infrastructure cost. Yeah, go ahead, sir. On this road, too, I maybe missed it. Is there a sidewalk that goes up along there? There is. Yeah. There's uh, this sidewalk right here. Um, so the idea is that we want to create a walkable community. There's a lot of exciting things about this parcel that I was going to talk about in the market study. Um, uh, although you, you all might be pretty excited already with all the things that I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, but yes, there's, there's, uh, this connects to the sidewalk on Northfield Street, and there is a sidewalk that um, uh, goes down the whole development. Unfortunately, the, even at 10% grade, 10% um, is just the steepness of the road. Um, that's pretty steep for somebody in a wheelchair. Uh, so we, we couldn't really create an, uh, like a multi-use path, unfortunately. Um, and uh, but that was something we had hoped for. It's just, it would just be almost impossible for us to do that without blowing up the whole mountain, basically. And we're not going to do that, just to be clear. Um, so getting into costs, this is so we've talked about the uh, basically all that is to say this is the number of units we can build. And by the way, there's a way to get up there. That's that was a very important piece. Now we're going to talk about the financial feasibility of this project. Um, so. There are really three phases of implementation for a project like this. Uh, there's pre-development and infrastructure. And then we also, as I said, had uh, designed for two phases of housing. Um, by the way, the, the price modeling was came come up by a, a lovely Paul up in the front here. So anything, any questions you guys have about that? Paul Simons with VIS and Park Architecture. Uh, he's, he's the guy to answer questions about, um, about cost estimating. Basically, the purpose of determining the financial feasibility of this project, um, uh, tonight we're just going to look at pre-development and infrastructure costs and compare that to the number of units that can be reasonably built on the parcel uh, to determine if 115 units can support the total cost of pre-development. Can 115 units support is it, uh, 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 the, the total cost of building out the infrastructure? So as I said, VI, oh, there we go, is it all again? Um, as I said, VIS construction consultants reviewed the proposed site neighborhood plan and developed a cost estimate with input from engineering ventures and park architecture or other partners. And the construction um, estimate, uh, the, the estimate is based on the conceptual plan that I showed you earlier and includes design and construction contingencies. Um, we expect that it's not going to be precise. There are contingencies, um, as well as estimated additional costs associated with the project budget, uh, such as budget engineering fees, permitting, third-party fees, uh, third-party testing, and et cetera. Um, the construction market has also been very volatile uh, for the last couple of years, uh, with labor and especially material prices fluctuating significantly up and down. So this, uh, this estimate assumes construction in the summer of 2024. Um, they, did in, we, they did include escalation, uh, which is the cost of every year of about 5 to 10 percent uh, escalation in the cost of materials and everything. Um, and then that should that five to ten percent should be applied for every year that this doesn't happen. So if it doesn't happen in 2024, another five to ten percent should be applied if it happens in 2025. Another ten percent happens in 2026. So the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to come. Assuming all of a sudden construction materials and contractors don't become a lot cheaper. 
which I don't see that happening, unless there was more housing. Um, so also, some of these numbers um, have been updated uh, with, uh, with actual numbers that I have um, received since this was done, um, also in permitting fees, and also the actual known price of acquisition. Um, so pre-development costs, which includes purchasing the properties, um, and these are based on the current purchase option agreements for the, the road and the large parcel, and that's a total of $553,000. Uh, architectural and engineering work, hiring consultants, insurance permit, as well as the cost of infrastructure, which includes roads, utilities, cutting, filleting, landscaping, electrical installation. All this is estimated to be $6.65 million. Uh, so the map I'm showing you here, uh, this is a cut and fill map. Um, so the green is fill, green and blue is fill, and red, uh, sorry, orange, yellow, and red are cutting. So as you can see, the entire, almost the entire development has to be cut or filled in some way. So there's a lot of expenses uh, that are just going into cutting and filling. Um, so $6.65 million, not, no big deal. No, nobody dropped dead, so that's good. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so basically, the cost estimate was broken down um, by general conditions, which, uh, which is the site for $243,000. Um, the existing road, so that's the private drive. Uh, drive I added an additional $200,000 for the extension that we talked about earlier. So the, um, redoing the, the existing private road is about half a million. The access road, which is that 1,000-foot stretch of land from uh, where the logging road starts at the turn and then goes up uh, to where the first 30-unit building, that's approximately uh, $536,000. The phase one loop, so just this phase here, is $1.99 million. Uh, one, one million, ninety, yeah, one point nine nine million, and then the phase two, uh, which is this section and the cottage cluster, was one million one hundred and fifty two thousand uh, dollars, and this one did include that ten percent escalation that we talked about because it, uh, it will happen in the future, as and um, because it, it's phase two. Uh, it also includes the cost estimation six point six five. Also includes landscaping the acquisition insurance and uh, permitting. Um, so just so you know, permitting alone uh, will cost at least $215,000. Uh, that's assuming the new cap of $165,000 on Act 250. That's also assuming we have to go through Act 250. Um, that was done recently through the HOME Act. Uh, the h permits that are required for this, uh, we'll need a, uh, from the state an operational stormwater permit a uh, construction stormwater permit, a uh, wastewater permit. We'll probably have to go through Act 250. Uh, and then local, and then the construction, um, uh, the state construction per modification of source. Here at the local level, uh, sorry, in a wastewater system and potable water uh, supply permit. At the local level, we'll need our standard planning and zoning permits, uh, subdivision, plan unit development, and then building permits. So lots of permitting, although um, so, based on, um, based on uh, using a very simple calculation of how we look at the feasibility of this, the financial feasibility, and we take the number of units, 115, or we take the total cost, 6.65 million, and we divide it by 115 units, and we come up with the pre-development cost of $57,827. Um, so the, to give you some context, when you, I don't know if folks have been looking at land recently and what it costs to buy a parcel of land to build a house on, um, this is pretty reasonable uh, for a house that, a uh, parcel of land that's connected to water and wastewater and there's even room there for somebody to make a profit if they sold it. Um, to get a more accurate sense of uh, what the actual cost per unit is, we can break it down by phase because of the different phases of construction had different costs. Uh, in phase one, um, sorry, I'll, uh, so phase one uh, is roughly, uh, that's 60 units, um, and uh, that roughly breaks down to $63,950. A lot of that has to do with that half a million dollar road um, that, to get up there and just the initial pieces. Um, 
So that's, that's the most expensive. Phase two, which is 47 units, is 38,300. Um, and then there's the cottage cluster, which we're almost considering, like I said, a separate development of eight units is $32,500. Um, and that's because it requires additional infrastructure like a water pump. Um, sorry, I just uh, lost my place there. But basically, um, these these numbers are comparable to other uh, other developments of its size, and so uh, from a even from a simple per, uh, division point of view or by phases, all these costs are pretty comparable, pretty doable. Uh, so the financial cost of infrastructure versus the number of units does support uh, the idea that this is a financially feasible. Um, Uh, so these are common site costs uh, shown in the concept design, and it does not include the site cost specific to each building. Uh, so this does not this the 6.65 is not houses on top. Uh, we um, that is much more expensive. Uh, we did some very rough estimating of the cost of construction in order to complete a pro forma to apply for some grants and also figure out if we can get this project fully funded based if uh, a developer were to build it all out. Um, but that's not really necessary or relevant in terms of determining the financial feasibility of this project at this time, uh, since we're really just trying to figure out uh, whether we can build here. And, and so we're looking at number of units versus uh, the cost of infrastructure. And that does not include houses. Um, so we then, uh, after we completed the architectural and engineering feasibility study, uh, we completed a market study. Uh, we worked with Doug Kennedy from Doug Kennedy Advisors to complete a market study of our project. Uh, the, re the report summarizes research analysis completed uh, and completed to complete the preliminary assessment of the market-based feasibility of the proposed development. Um, it was focused on providing an indication of the market demand for the project. If we build this, will they come? You know. Uh, so, uh, and I think anybody uh, who's been watching the housing market or reading the news knows that this, this is obviously yes, there is a clear case uh, for housing in the area. Uh, but it's good to have a market study that says that. Um, and so, so basically, the assessment shows that there is more than adequate market pools for each of the major components of the project: uh, the fair market, the low income, the rental, and the home ownership. Um, and also, the, the fact that we are completing this in phases uh, will result in a rapid lease up of all available rental units so, um, and, and provide sufficient prospects for ownership units to be constructed by Habitat, which is what we wanted to do. Um, so basically, the preliminary, as I said, the preliminary market study shows that there's a clear case for continuing the project. Um, it looked at, uh, it used two market areas to determine the the uh, the need or for this type of project, you looked at your primary market. Uh, these are buyers of the houses who would come and live here, um, and so the primary market or the p primary folks that would come and live here live within 15 minute drive of Montpelier. Um, so you know they're looking at age, they're looking at demographics and income. Where do they work? Uh, their uh, their age has is directly correlated with their propensity to move. Uh, where older folks typically don't want to move as far. Also, if you have kids in a school district, you're not going to want to move out of your move out of your school district. So even the secondary market, which is Washington County, which is 15 to 35 minute drive. Uh, from Montpelier. So this was, uh, there's a high demand for this specific type of project, and there I did it again, um, because uh, it's an easy access to downtown Montpelier. It's literally like an eight minute walk. Um, there, the demand for housing for Montpelier exceeds the current available housing, we all know that. Um, and um, there's, uh, this would provide great affordable first time home ownership opportunities uh, for seniors and young families to live in a stable environment. There's not a lot of um, affordable uh, starter homes for people out there, so this pro provides some more of that. Uh, obviously there's a significant interest in rentals, this would provide a number of interests. Um, the, right now the rental and ownership market is super tight. Uh, and the rent continues to increase since 2019. The rent has increased by 4.4%. Uh, that feels pretty low at this point. 
Um, with the market also showed that there's a high demand for one and two bedroom housing. We provide a lot of that with the, um, with the apartment building. Um, Montpelier has a very low unemployment rate, 2.2%. Uh, and this is an indicator of the health of the economy, um, which affects the demand for housing. Uh, the other thing is uh, people really want to live in Montpelier. Uh, we have a great school district. We have a fantastic community, a fantastic downtown. Uh, we're the capital. Um, but the problem is, is there's not housing for people to live here. There's not enough housing options. At the time of the study, there was only 11 uh, houses for sale at the time. Um, and I don't know what it is right now, but it's, it's, it's pretty low. And because of that demand, uh, s uh, between 2015 and 2021, uh, Montpelier saw a 19.2% increase in the value of their homes. And that's probably higher now into 2023. Uh, and the average median price of a home, sorry, the median house of, price of a home in Montpelier was $359,000. Um, it's way too expensive uh, for a lot of people. Um, in Washington County, it saw in 2015 and 2021 a 40% increase in the value of their homes. That's huge. And what that is, is actually a reflection of the lack of housing in Montpelier. People want to live in Montpelier, and they have the money, and they have the means to live in Montpelier, but there's no housing supply, so they take that same money and they go and live in Williamstown or somewhere else where there, there is housing available. And that is driving up uh, the cost of housing in Washington County. Uh, finally, um, as we talked about the phased approach, um, there's a, a, something called an absorption rate. How quickly will people buy these houses? Um, they expect that the affordable rentals will be gone in four to five months. Market, rentals, uh, market rate rentals will be gone in one to two months. And Habitat for Humanity units, the 22 units, will be um, fully bought within four to five years. And we're not planning to do it. Uh, we're doing it over a 10-year period. So that's, that's too quack, quick for us. But um, there's, because of our um, homeowner requirements, a little le lower, less of an absorption rate. So basically, there's a clear case uh, for uh, continuing this project. There's a clear need for this project based on this market assessment. Um, so we did uh, phase one environmental site assessment. It was enga we engaged KAS Consulting to complete the study. Uh, they uh, looked at 102, 116, and 120 Northfield Street. That's these, these parcels here, and then the Montpelier Housing Authority and Dan Jones's house. Uh, the goal was to identify uh, what are called ident um, recognized environmental conditions. Uh, and basically what this is, is, is there a presence of hazardous substance or petroleum products in, on, or in the subject property area um, due to the release, due to a release to the environment? Is there toxic stuff in the environment? Is there likely presence of ha hazardous or petroleum products in, on, or at the subject pro property? And the presence of hazardous substance or petroleum products in, or at the subject property, um, during our project, uh, property, excuse me, that pose a material threat to the future release to the, um, to the environment. Um, this does not include other environmental conditions such as wildlife habitat, wetlands, endangered species, et cetera. Uh, this would actually be uh, reviewed in a complete environmental review uh, prior to receiving what's called an environmental release letter. Uh, KAS reviewed the available information. Um, and basically determine, uh, no, not basically, they did determine that the current historical uses of the property are not likely to present a material threat of releases of hazardous substance and petroleum products. So there's no recognized environmental conditions on this property. So that's, that's really fantastic and that, uh, uh, that could have potentially been an issue if there were. Um, and surrounding properties do not appear to present environmental risk based on their distance and location. Um, and basically, uh, they recommend no further action. So that's, that, those are the conclusions of our environmental site assessment, which is, again, based on hazardous materials. So based on the conclusions of the completed deliverables conducted for the purposes of this planning grant, we determined that there are no historically sensitive areas or recognized environmental conditions that would prevent the development of this project. There is an access route to the property which can be built to meet the city of Montpelier's planning and zoning regulations and which would also serve as a conduit to the required utilities 
There are no traffic concerns related to the new proposed intersection. There is sufficient buildable area to support 115 building units, housing units. A general PUD enables a developer to build a dense 115 unit housing development on the buildable area of the parcel, which also enables half of the parcel to be entered into conservation. The current zoning of residential 9,000 allows for 242 units, which meets that 115, is above that 115. Uh, and there is adequate capacity within uh, the city's municipal systems to support a new project of this size. The overall development cost per unit is within a comparable range based on similar recent projects, and the proposed mix of housing will have the potential to serve 51% of LMI, uh, low to medium income populations. Um, based on this information, over two years of research, over $76,000 in expenses, at least eight public hearings, and 100, hundreds of hours of volunteer time and my time, uh, we have determined that a 115 unit housing development located on this parcel is both physically and financially viable. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so. A lot of stuff. Um, so I just want to comment too, and then um, additionally, our objectives were met. We uh, Habitat for Humanity. We, cr uh, you know, we've designed something uh, that has publicly maintained trail networks. We we d we found a PUD that worked. We were able to create a, design, a concept design that had a sense of place. Um, we also designed an income sensitive, a mixed income community. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential. We did make sure all the roofs in the concept design were southern facing, so they could have solar panels on them. Um, and it, you know, we and we there is a lot of land that could be conserved. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to that carbon negative, but we certainly are going to build a low carbon product. It has the potential. Um, so that's pretty exciting. That's what that's why we got here. That's the point of this. Um, in terms of our timeline of what, how this could go forward. And please keep in mind that this is the planning phase. Uh, there's a lot more to come. Um, this is the initial part that just says, we can do this. Um, so after this, we still would like to complete our environmental review of the parcel. Uh, there's just two other things that we have to do. Uh, and then um, I have to bring this to my board of directors to see what they want to do if they want to purchase this property so that we can facilitate the development of this project. Um, uh, and then early uh, 2024 is when we hope to engage a private developer. They would be the ones that would be responsible for building this out. Uh, through 2024, they would be applying for funding sources to ideally become fully funded. And if everything goes according to plan, they would start planning and permitting uh, in 2025, break ground in April of 2025. And 10 years later, maybe, I don't know, nobody, uh, that's, I'm just going to say 10 years later, we might have a complete project of 115 units in 20, 2035. Feels pretty far away. Um, but that's, that's kind of realistically what happens with these. Um, other things that I just want to point out is, uh, you know, we actually are, uh, this project was listed as a housing prior on the Vermont housing priority list, which means that we, this project is, um, would, uh, it look, gets looked at by major funding sources at the state and the region. Um, and, uh, and we also did, uh, we're recommended for a federal earmark of a million dollars for the road through Bernie Sanders. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, we got lost in the, in the fray there, so we're, we're not going to get that million dollars. But it is exciting. We're on the um, federal government's radar. Um, the other thing that we want to look at um, to, to make this a priority housing project is uh, to work with the city uh, to designate this area um, into a uh, redistrict, not redistricted, it's, that's the wrong term, but put it into a, um, a development area, uh, either a TIF district, a tax incremental finance district, or a tax, tax incremental finance project, if that ever becomes a thing. There's another thing called neighborhood development area or a growth district. These are all uh, designated development areas through the state that, create, that help with um, creating what's called uh, a priority housing project. Uh, and that opens us up to more grant opportunities. It also could significantly uh, reduce the cost of permitting. Um, so this is actually, and, and not only that, it becomes a very um, sellable point for a private developer. Finding this private developer is probably going to be the, one of the most challenging things. So we, uh, you know, there's not a lot of them out there in Vermont that can do something of this scale. So we really have to sell it. If we want to build this in, in Montpelier, we have to create a sellable project that 
they want to be a part of. Part of that is community engagement, community support, um, but it's also having these things in place, like having being on the uh, creating a priority housing project or being in one of these uh, development areas. Um, so that makes it more enticing for them to, to, to be a part of, in, in addition, because it, it reduces the cost. So these are things that we would like to work with the city on. Uh, and I know that the city is excited to you know, see this move forward, assuming we can make everything fall into the city's ordinances. Um, and they want to they help support this, and they already have been supporting it significantly um, you know, with Josh and, and Mike and Meredith. Uh, so we're, they want to see this move forward. And so these are the things we would work on them with um, to, to make this move forward. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. And um, I saw that I wasn't sure if there was anybody from the city that had any comments. I saw Kurt was joined us um, on, the, uh, on Zoom there, or Josh. I don't know if you had anything to add. Uh, or if there was anybody from the city that wanted to add anything about the project. Um, I mean, I'll add that I'm glad to see the redesign intersection as part of the presentation. I think initially that was a, that was a big concern of ours because it didn't meet our intersection um, requirements. I think maybe Corey wants to speak up against you know about the slope. That's still a concern, but I I'd like to hear that there's a commitment to redesign it so that it does conform to our regulations. No doubt that will change the cost, um, but I think it's it's important for it to meet our our, our regulations. So I, we're we're ecstatic that you're making that commitment to do that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think all the deliverables are what we were anticipating um, as part of the planning grant. So kudos to you and your team for making it happen. Thank you, Josh. I'll just say, uh, my name is Corey Lyon with Public Works. Uh, I just want to say, uh, one of the things that I have for his level of uh, coordination and outreach with our department, uh, very helpful through this. And just uh, note on the roadway uh, as designed, um, you know, the sticking point was our ability to maintain that, especially in the winter as designed. Again, as, as Josh said, uh, happy to hear that there's another way to rectify that. Um, and uh, everything else said, uh, accurate uh, capacity for our utilities uh, is there. And that's uh, all I got for it. Yeah, and I'll follow up again, you know, but I think using the TIP designation or NDA is definitely our goal. You know, I know you've talked to Mike and myself about it, uh, and we're engaging in that process. It's going to take us over the next six to 12 months to really sort of figure out what that looks like. Of course, the state is going to change the whole designation process <laughs> next year. We don't know what that's going to look like, but uh, we're fully committed to ensuring that whatever is out there for us, that the parcel is enrolled and so that we can take advantage of any incentives that are out there. I just want to ask, I, Kurt, if you have anything now, uh, you know, speak now or. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'm Kurt Monica. I'm the director of public works. Um, uh, you know, the, the city does support this development. Um, my focus is really on uh, utilities is kind of my, um, my primary area of, uh, of expertise with the city. And uh, we did just reconstruct Norfield Street um, just a few years ago. Um, and uh, we constructed it in a way to support future development along this corridor. So there is adequate supply um, on the water side as well as the sewer. And, um, and you addressed well. Uh... Kurt, we lost you. I don't know if you can hear us at all. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Um. My connection may not be very good here. Can you hear me? I don't know if anybody can hear us. Oh, no, I think we're speaking for the president. Uh, I can hear Kurt. Corey can hear Kurt. That's good. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> Corey can hear me. <laughs> there we go, Kurt. Yeah, we can hear you now, Kurt. Okay, I was just saying that um, we reconstructed Norfield Street just a few years ago, and uh, we did it in a way to support developments off this corridor. And um, there is certainly adequate, as you said, uh, Zach, 
um, adequate supply on the water and sewer side to support uh, this development. We lost you again, Kurt. I'm sorry, man. I think the speaker's batteries are low, is my guess. Um, well... <laughs> We'll see if I can make a change here. Hang on one second. No, no, we can hear you now. I think you've got. Um... Yeah, talk fast. Yeah, talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, I was just saying that the that the Norfield Street utilities can support this development. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was what we wanted. Cool. I'll um... leave it. I'll leave it at that. All right, so I'm going to start with fielding some questions in the room here. Um, Paul, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I just had a, um, a question. When you say you engage the developer, what what becomes the relationship between the habitat for humanity and the developer? Are you like do you own the land and the developer of the buildings, or do you turn the whole thing over to the developer, or what's the what's the model? Uh, so we ultimately. That recommendation has not been made yet. Um, the board, of, my board of directors, has to make that determination. Um, I, uh, and I don't know what the best path is. I think, you know, we we've been working with a private developer um, I, uh, that wants to work with us. They see the value of having um, Habitat for Humanity being the public face of a development of this size. We know the people in the town already, um, and uh, so you know, there's. So they might want to work with us regardless of our, our stake in this project. Um, also, we are the only organization that's building single family or duplex houses for uh, starter uh, affordable housing for low income families. And if you want to include that in your development right now, you're basically going to Habitat for Humanity because the cost of doing it on your own is so expensive. Uh, and we. We have a model that works, uh, so uh, so there might be an incentive where the uh, for for the private developer to part partner with us regardless of our stake in the project. Um, the other alternative is that we do own the project, we own the parcel that is our financial stake in the project, and ultimately the parcel then gets turned over to uh, the private developer, given it given it given to them. But we have this. Our stake is the value of that land, the appraised value of the land. And so now we can use that to negotiate how many parcels of land we can build on ourselves. Um, or there's some sort of combination of those things. Um, uh, but that we haven't actually made that determination yet. That's the piece that the board, the, our task force has to recommend to the board of directors, and our board of directors has to approve. So I guess my, my concern is just would just be that your um, you know your goals are maintained through that uh, through that project, and that it doesn't uh, sort of run away from you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because there can be you know developers have a lot of experience, and and um, you know once they get in the driver's seat, um, I hope that you guys can maintain your um, your aspirations for the for the project. We do too. We put a lot of work into this to to not um, so. I can't, I, I'm, I'm, that would be my, I think the best way for us to maintain that is to own the property, put some restrictions in place. Maybe we're putting conservation easements in prior uh, to, to, to uh, handing over the land to the private developer. But that's my preference. Um, but um, my board of directors ultimately has to make that decision, and we have not made a recommendation yet. And that some of them are in the room here today, so. <laughs> um, as, a, as a board member, <laughs> I might be. I, I I'm not going to speak for the whole board, but for myself, I think we're the board is pretty determined to make sure that the overall goals that Zach set out for the habitat are going to stay there, and, and it's not going to be easy, and it's going to take a little process to work with the developer. But we're not going to. Our goal is to make sure that that doesn't happen. That we that we stay. Um, the direction and purpose of the development stays the way it is, as, as previously. And our board meetings are open. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we, we will have, we're, we're a pretty dedicated board, and I think we're, we've been doing this for a while. 
one thing I'll add too is you know we uh, we are a small nonprofit. Um, our our budget is typically two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. That's what we bring in in uh, in revenues. So for us to take on a project of this scale where we actually have to buy five hundred a five hundred thousand dollar parcel, uh, we are going to be seeking grants, but specifically donations from members in the community. That's how everything we do is supported is through donations. And so um, if there are people in Montpelier that want this project to happen. Please support us through donations, or get your friends to support us through donations, or get their friends to also donate to us as well. But that's, uh, that would be, if I went to the board of directors and I said, uh, we want to move forward to this project, and I've got, I've got $250,000, people that want to contribute $250,000 specifically to buy this par project, that would be a strong incentive for them to say yes. Um, but uh, ultimately, we have to look out for the interest of our mission and our existing homeowners who we're currently serving across Washington and Orange County. Nathan. Good to see you. Thank you, you too. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> so listen carefully to the way you just said that, and I understand the board members in the room. Uh, have you identified a sort of go or no go point where if you, if, if, if it falls below, right, I just heard you say very firmly, we have existing constituents, we have existing programs, that's our first priority. Um, uh, to the board members as well. Is it what's the what's the tipping point? I don't know yet. I, I, to, to be perfectly to, to honest, we we we're glad we got to this point where this is a feasible project. We didn't know six months ago whether this was going to be feasible, given especially the road conditions and getting getting sewer up there and getting water up there. That was and from that to our normal site, which is just a curb cut. <laughs> right. Which is, it, it, we didn't know whether this was going to be, but we've got it to the feasibility study. Now we have to determine that. I don't know what it is. I, I can't determine what that go or no go is. Um, I think we, we have to maintain a certain amount of affordable housing. Um, that 51% is a nice number. I like that. Um, we have to be able to build a number of houses that meet our determination and that we can put, um, use our process to put people in there that will be and how many of those um, will be a key determination that we look at um, and uh, the relationship with the developers is, is going to be key we're going to need a developer that is willing to work with us as we are rather than someone who comes in here and just says i can do this you know just give me the land that's not going to fly yeah the um this this project is is tailored for um, subsidized housing uh, to support it. Um, without subsidized housing, this is not really a realistic um, uh, par a development for fair market housing uh, because of so, what I talked about earlier. Um, that thousand foot stretch of road is half a million dollars that you have to spend on a road before you can build a house. Uh, that's a lot of money to spend and not be able to get a return on. Uh, so there's a reason this parcel hasn't been developed thus far. Um, so it really is designed to be subsidized affordable housing, and then the market rate housing helps subsidize the rest of it uh, to make the, the affordable housing doable. Um, so there's, it's, even if we didn't move forward with this project or couldn't find a developer, it seems pretty unlikely that a private developer would be able to do anything about it, and I'm not sure that the current owner would want that to happen. I don't know what they would do. Um, it might make, I mean, this might make sense to just donate to the city, turn it into a private park or, or public park. So there's, there's also just constraints around the property uh, that make it really difficult for just somebody to come in and do whatever they want to. Granted, Somebody with a couple million bucks could do whatever they, actually, ten million dollars yeah. could do whatever they wanted to with it. Right. Yeah. So is, and I, I, I know I'm late, so I may have missed this. Is there any, you know, to the city folks, city staff folks, is there any sort of movement politically within the city council to consider do we in the community commit to the five hundred thousand to make the make the road access? You know, that's our, that's our kind of view. Like, we want housing? All right, let's step up and do it. Is that a, is that a part of the conversation? If not, I mean, I don't, I don't think the question's been asked, but I also don't believe we're in a financial position to, to offer anything. We're on a spending freeze right now. I mean, 
we can't even go to conferences that cost us 60 bucks to register today. So, um, but I'd say, is there, an, is there an opportunity to have that question asked? Yes, but not at this time. Um, maybe in another six months. Um, there's also the housing trust fund. We don't have half of that um, in it. Um, so, you know, but as I think a lot of us in the planning department um, and those who have worked with the housing committee and housing task force over the years, we have wanted the, the city council to approve appropriating upwards of $175,000 a year to go into the housing trust fund. And that still remains, I think we would, you know, we need to be committing more into the housing trust fund, just mm -hmm. under 10, just not cutting. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it, it also just having the city on board with this saying that they want this, they're looking at, they, they've already put DPW, they've looked at this, they've made a major commitment. Them working with us is going to help us get more federal dollars. I mean, that's just that's just a, a, a private fund. So that's that's we're not fighting city hall here. We've got we're all moving in the same direction, which you know, they may have money. They you know, the Porter's Church Council's here, which is understandable. This is Vermont, you know, the North don't have anything. <laughs> but 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 I think the the cooperation is going to be great in and of itself. Yeah. Um, it would be nice for them to do it. Um, make a motion at the board. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Kind of, uh, a response, I guess. I think some of the next steps in low hanging fruit is actually that NDA, Neighborhood Development Area, or Growth Center designation, because with it comes a bunch of benefits, not just to the developer, but also the municipality in terms of fund, funding available in turn, and also priority consideration for that funding because you're designated there. So it, it could, there could be CDBG grants for public infrastructure, roads, utilities, that kind of stuff that, that could come available. And so I, yeah, I'd encourage that uh, to be one of the next um, parts of this to, to, you know, to, to go after. I 100% I agree. I think, and I, and Josh, you heard Josh say it, you know, they're committed to helping out with that. You know, that's, that's not a cost commitment. It's a time commitment. They could do that. And we know, you know, the city's not getting revenues and parking right now. They're not getting sales and rooms tax. You know, they've gone through three years of disasters, COVID and now a flood. Like uh, to ask the city, which is ultimately taxpayers in Montpelier to, to shoulder this burden of this project is, is, um, is really difficult. So we're not going there yet, but I, we've heard really good things from the city that they do support it. I, you know, I, I think about, uh, you know, like the Kellogg Hubbard Library um, and people with wealth in this community that used to invest in public projects. Uh, we know we have wealth in the city um, and a lot of uh, civic minded people. I think we uh, we're hoping that some of those folks will step up and make this project possible. Um, I think that's a really good place for the citizens of Montpelier to help out. In addition to that, too, I think what the designation will do is help shore up what I think it was Paul was talking about, about um, a, a developer coming in, right? It shores up the requirements for priority housing. So it really, you know, it, it also provides incentives on the permitting side that you said, too. So it really incentivizes your development partner to be part of that, you know. Are there other questions inside the room? And then I'll ask folks on Zoom if they have any questions. Good discussion, so. Cool. Uh, anybody on Zoom have anything they would like to say and speak quickly? I do. I'm yes, Tracy Botany. Hello, how are you? Um, I've, I'm gonna butter um, 7 Pleasant Street. So on the, the end of the street that has the development behind it. Just a couple questions. Um, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, I know this is all conceptual that what we're looking at um, and understand that and appreciate that conservation buffer. Um, my question is, and maybe just a consideration when moving forward and, you know, if the project moves forward um, about the property line, um, I noticed on most of the drawings I've seen so far that the, the uh, I think the city uh, parcel maps, the lines are a bit off. Stacy, hold on just a second. You got the speaker died. This just I'll tell you when we're started up here. Yeah, give a sign. Give a sign. We click it. 
you don't want to look at I'm not a nonprofit. I've been using that slide for years. <laughs> All right. Uh, Stacy, you are ready to go. Tracy. Tracy. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, so you can't really see it on here, the back of where I live, um, but essentially the lot, you know, if you look at the parcel maps on the city's website, oh, there you go. So it's a little tough to see because it's so tiny, but basically the, the what I've seen from plans are the, the line is kind of going right through my backyard, essentially through our backyard. And our shed is shown, is always shown on the parcel maps. It's shown on that larger parcel uh, that could be developed. So just to just voicing it like out there now for future reference, um, I'm assuming that you guys will do a, an actual survey of the property. Um, yeah. We actually had our property surveyed uh, recently, so um, that was just one you know one item of concern, or just to mention a technical item. The other technical item uh, was stormwater is a huge thing, and just just curious. I know that you know this whole feasibility study was done, but I'm assuming it was kind of done uh, before the flood. And I know that uh, someone in the room there has a property that was flooded pretty good during that, uh, you know, another person on Pleasant Street. And so that gully oh, or that- you, hold on, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you're all set, Tracy. Sorry. Oh, no, all right, it's, uh, there, can we, sorry, just a second. You could, uh... Tracy, can you hear, uh, can you, can you try talking now? There. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Uh, thank you for doing Zoom so I could cook dinner for my family at the same time. Um, anyway, so the, just, just about that gully or the hollow and how much water came down that in the flood is very concerning. Um, you can actually see a difference in what it looks like now after the amount of water that came down it. So just, um, you know, for technical items in the future and designing the stormwater, really looking at how that's going to be in maybe another flood. So, uh, you know, the stormwater retention ponds and such, I hope those can be not too close to Pleasant Street neighborhoods in case they fail of any, you know, in a, in a high storm event. Um, you know, so just I'm really interested in the kind of the stormwater. Um, that's kind of my number one thing because of the hill behind us and the amount of water that we get in our basement just before the flood. And then during the flood, it was like a river. Um, so, and I know there's others on our street that had it even worse than us. So that, that was all I wanted to mention, those couple concerns and thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry to hear about the flooding. Anybody? Oh. Can I just yeah. What you said. Uh, so I'm from the Hot Tower and I live on Pleasant Street also. And um, my husband and I own a property there that the drainage area is going through. As we have that as a rental house, and um, I think what Tracy was referring to is during the flood, the driveway of that house washed out, and even in non-flood times, like. A lot of water comes through that yard and um, goes into the drainage that's like right across the street from that. So I guess I would share Tracy's concern that you know what's going to happen in that whole area during this development. And I mean, I would just think that whole system has to, would have to be upgraded because I don't see how it can take more water than we currently do. Yeah, the the, uh, the final wastewater design would be done prior to implementation. What we've created is a is a concept design that would work um, from what we know, but um, but yeah, those those and and I think everybody's thinking about the hundred year storm is not every hundred years anymore. So I think I think we have to be thinking about it. So anybody else on Zoom have any questions or comments? Okay, well, um, so I encourage folks, uh, you should have, uh, if you have not already, please sign in. Um, 
we are recording this meeting so I can uh, look back at other folks that um, were in the Zoom meeting and add those to the attendee list. Um, and just ask that, do that again. Um, just ask, uh, you know, if you want to stay in touch, um, you know, you can, we have a newsletter that we send out. I also have a specific list of people that I'm sending out emails to for this project. Um, uh, this is our final public hearing, so we will not be doing any more of these, although we will try to keep the community posted about the progress of the, of the project. Um, obviously, if we get additional funding like uh, community development block grants for implementation, those do require more public hearings, and we would want to do public hearings anyways to continue to keep the community involved. Um, so you can stay in touch by signing in, and I'll add your name to our list, uh, and my contact information is there at the bottom there. Um, and uh, you know, uh, just want to you know, uh, remind folks that they can donate to us to help us. That's a reason uh, for us to move forward. Uh, when you donate right uh, you know, for Northfield Street Development, we will earmark it for this project. Um, and uh, you know, I just, just to put a face to the type of thing that we're doing, uh, this is Karen. Uh, she lives in Warren, and she's owned her house for 30 years, and she just paid it off. And she oftentimes, she comes to the state house with us um, often. She's our best homeowner. And she, um, and she talks about how when she applied for our house, she was couch surfing, and she was like, needing to ask her friends and family for a couch. She sent her kids through college, and her kids now have kids. And now she is providing a couch for her family to live on. Um, so that's what we do with Habitat for Humanity. Those are the types of stories we like to see and perpetuate. And we want this to we want to see this over and over again with this project. So, um, just, uh, and as a nonprofit, we we always have to ask people for money. So please give us more money. Um, but thank you again for coming. I appreciate it, and I ask everybody to stay in touch. Have a nice evening.